ಚಕ್ಷುರುಗುರವೆ ನಮ ಶ್ರೀಚೈತನ್ಯ ಮನೋಭೀಷ್ಟೂತಲೆ ಸ್ವಯಂ ರೂಪ ಕದಮಿ ಸ್ವಾಪದಿಖಂ ವಂದೇಹಂ ಶ್ರೀಗುರೋ ಶ್ರೀಜುಥಾಪದಕಮಲ ಶ್ರೀಗುರುನ್ ವೈಷ್ಣವಂಶ್ಚೂಪ ಸಾಗ್ರಜಾಥ ಸಹಕನ ರಘುನಾಥ ಸಜೀವ ಸಾಧ್ವೈತ ಸಾಪದೂತ ಪರಿಜನ ಸಹಿತ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಶ್ರೀರಾಧಾಕೃಷ್ಣ ಸಹಕನ ಲಲಿತ ಶ್ರೀ ವಿಶಾಖನ್ ಪಿತಂಶ ಹೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಕರುಣಾ ಸಿಂಧು ದೀನಬಂಧು ಜಗತ್ಪತೆ ಗೋಪೇಶ ಗೋಪಿಕಾ ಖಾಂಠ ರಾಧಾಖಾಂಠ ನಮೋಸ್ತೆ ತಪ್ತ ಕಾಂಚನ ಗೌರಾಂಗಿ ರಾಧೆ ಬೃಂದಾಬನೇಶ್ವರಿ ವೃಷಭಾನು ಸುಧೆ ದೇವಿ ಪ್ರಣಮಿ ಹರಿ ಪ್ರಿಯ ವಂಶಕಲ್ಪತರೂಪ್ಯ ಕೃಪಾ ಸಿಂಧೂಪ್ಯ ಪತಿಥಾನೇಭ್ಯೋ ವೈಷ್ಣವೇಭ್ಯೋ ನಮೋ ನಮಃ ಶ್ರೀಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭು ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಗದಾಧಾರ್ ಶ್ರೀವಾಸಿ ಗೌರಭಕ್ತಬೃಂದ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರಿ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರಿ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರಿ ಹರಿ I am very grateful to be with all of you today. I welcome you to Radha Gopinath Temple. beginning of the Bhagavad Gita in the great Mahaparat Krishna accepted the role of the chariot driver for Arjuna Arjuna is Krishna's devotee Krishna is Parabrahman. Who the Vedic scriptures declare as Bhagavan, the Supreme Brahman, the source of all avatars. And as we read in the first chapter of the Gita, Arjuna fell into a state of great bewilderment. Still, because he was the Lord's devotee, Krishna accepted the role of the driver of his chariot. And Arjuna told Krishna, take my chariot between the two armies. I want to see who has assembled here today. Krishna, obedient to the instruction of Arjuna, drove the chariot between the two armies. 
And then Krishna spoke, Arjuna, see who has assembled here today. And Arjuna saw so many family members on both sides. Whenever I come here to Radha Gopinath Temple and sit here and look out at all of you, I always remember these words of Krishna, see who has assembled here today. <laughs> But you are, uh, it's such a pleasure to see everyone assembled here. But we are all on the same side, so it's so <laughs> It's very beautiful. When we gather together, for the purpose of bringing each other closer to that highest purpose of life, loving devotional service to the Supreme Lord. Then spiritual intimacy can grow between us. And ultimately this is the intimacy that the heart is yearning for. Lord Chaitanya asked Ramananda Rai, what is the greatest form of distress? And Ramananda Rai said, to be separated from your devotees is the only distress I know. When we share Krishna with each other, Krishna, the one supreme being who is the father, mother of all living entities, who is all attractive, Krishna reveals himself in most special way when devotees share that remembrance with each other. This is the special feature of kirtan or san kirtan nama chintamani krishna's chaitanya rasvikra that is the supreme lord or krishna has descended within the name nam nam lord chaitanya prayed nam nam akarida Nijasarabha Shaktish, that the beauty, the sweetness, the power of that absolute truth, Sri Nanda Nandana, is within the name. It's a transcendental sound vibration. Golokera Premadana Harinam Sankirtan. The sound vibration has descended from the spiritual world. Krishna reciprocates when we chant the name with humility and devotion. When we come together to hear and to chant, the actual spirit is we are sharing Krishna with each other. And in sharing Krishna with each other, together we are offering our hearts, like one heart, for the pleasure of the Lord. The ahankar, the false ego, creates so many differentiations. So many different conceptions of who we are, what we want, and therefore, in this age of Kali, where ahankar or the ego is so strong, there are, we are so vulnerable to quarrel and hypocrisy. It is practically everywhere, on every level of life, the potential of quarrel and hypocrisy. Because everyone wants to have their own interests, either individually or collectively, that's the center, the focus of life. 
and because there are so many different mentalities, every living entity has a individual unique, unique mentality. There are no two people in all of creation that see anything exactly in the same way. Because whatever we see is filtered through our ego, our senses, and our conceptions. What is our desires? What is our aversions? What are the conditionings of what we've been through in our life? All of our experiences? No one has had the same experiences. And therefore no one sees anything or anyone the same way. quite incredible. Recently, I was in Chicago and it was snowing. So much snow. Everywhere you went, it was halfway up to your knees almost in snow. And I just have these chapels from India. And <laughs> but anyways, I was just looking out as far as the eyes could see. And then I was driving on a highway. And everywhere I was going, miles and miles and miles, on each horizon on either side, was nothing but white snow. And I was thinking, that in the entire span of creation, there has never been two snowflakes that are exactly like each other. Did you ever see a snowflake under a microscope? It's actually very beautiful. It's very artistic. It's an incredible design. Symmetry, balance. And each one is unique. Similar, but unique. And we, see, we just see snow. We just see whiteness. But when you look at it under a microphone, I mean a microscope. Microphone. <laughs> you see something completely different. Now you have your Chopati beach just a couple blocks away. And it's become quite clean compared to years before. Years before it was like Chopati toilet. <laughs> <laughs> I used to, because Srila Prabhupada used to like to walk along the ocean side and the beach, so I would think, let me do that. And it was quite, um, an adventure, trying to <laughs> avoid other objects <laughs> that people were placing on the beach. <laughs> but now it's better, I think. But how much have you taken interest in the sand on the beach? I'd like to show you all a photo someone sent me. This one lady from California. She sent me a photograph of a magnification of ordinary sand on the beach. Incredible. There's stars and crescent moons and unbelievable colors and unbelievable shapes. It actually looks like a paradise. And when you just look at the sand, it just looks like every grain of sand's the same. But when you look at it under a microscope, this, I don't know how many times magnified, Every grain has a special shape and a special color and a special texture. And it's actually amazing. It's beautiful. It looks like 
unbelievable engineered artwork. But that artwork, with all its uniqueness and design and texture, is so small that our human eyes have no ability to even appreciate it at all. It just looks like sand. <laughs> so the perspective we have in this world is so limited. We're seeing everything according to how we are programmed. Our eyes are only programmed to see a snowflake in a certain way or a grain of sand in a certain way. Our ears, everything, our minds are programmed not only to see it in a certain way but to interpret according to our own experiences and conditionings in life. To see through the eyes of Krishna, as he is giving to us through gurus, through sadhus, and through shastras or scriptures, is to actually envision, experience life on a transcendental platform beyond the ego. And that is the actual fruit of spiritual life. To rise above the ego that divides us. When we are divided from Krishna within our heart, we are also divided from each other. And union is so conditional. Srila Prabhupada explains the United Nations. Everyone has their own flag and everyone has their own interests. And everyone's united. They're only united to the extent is that they have their own personal interests fulfilled. Which is a good thing in this world. But it's not very deep or sustainable. But when we actually understand our common interest, that we are all part and parcel of Krishna. We are all eternal souls. And this whole material creation is an incredible facility to realize our own potential and to realize our potential loving relationship with each other. Happiness, distress, honor, dishonor, pleasure, pain. The beautiful sand. And the things that people sometimes leave in the sand, which makes it not beautiful at all to the senses. Everything, everything is a facility. to understand our relationship with Krishna. And when we focus on that, then we can have deep relationships with each other that are transcendental to the ego and all of its incredible creations. This morning, Sri Dhammaji was asking, how is it that sometimes in practicing our devotion, we become hard-hearted toward others? Is that your question, Sri Dhammaji? Sri Dhamma has his special 
reserved seat. <laughs> I know exactly where he's going to be every class. <laughs> Seems like there's special reserved seats for you. But so often that is what happens. That's not about Krishna consciousness. And that's just about the ego. We're trying to free ourselves up through Krishna consciousness. In today's world, in the name of God, in the name of religion, there's hatred, there's hard-heartedness, there's egoism. Everything that true spiritual life is meant to overcome, the whole purpose of it is contradicted when it makes us hard-hearted and egoistic. In bhakti, we become hard-hearted to the selfish, egoistic urges of the mind and senses. But that is supposed to make our heart very soft. It makes our heart very soft toward loving God and compassion toward others. Tomorrow is the disappearance day of Uttarandat Thakur. He was a very special devotee of Lord Nityananda Prabhu. And Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami and Srila Prabhupada and Aracharyas, Vrindavan Das Thakur, when they talk about Uttarandat Thakur, they especially focus on a sp very special, essential lesson that Lord Chaitanya came to teach us. That in bhakti, or on this true spiritual path, it is the quality, the essential character that is important. In the world today, so often, we take things according to external appearances. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu made the Namacharya, the person who was the topmost teacher by his character and by his example, Haridas Thakur who happened to be born in a family of outcasts. And this was 500 years ago, when especially the Vedic society or the Hindu society was predominated by the teachings of Brahmins that very much looked at those outcasts with disdain. That it was impossible for them to attain self-realization. The best they could do is serve the Brahmins and obey them, and then in their next birth they would get a better chance. That was the way it was. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu extolled the glories of Haridas Thakur as if he had many, many mouths. He said, I am touching you for my purification. Because Haridas's character, because of his deep faith, because of his profound ability to forgive others who have tried to harm him, his ability to tolerate the temptations of illusion. 
Maya Devi, in so many forms, tried to distract him, but he was focused on the holy name. Beautiful prostitutes and Maya herself appear to him in a lonely place to distract his attention. But he was faithful to the holy name. And then another distraction. He was he was blasphemed, he was dishonored, he was sentenced to die for doing nothing wrong, he was tortured, he was beaten, he was thrown at a river like a piece of trash, taken to be dead, and he forgave them. Not only did he forgive them, but he went back to give them another chance. <laughs> In this way, he was tested. Would he be angry? Would he be vengeful? His heart was pure. Because ultimately we're all pure souls. Whatever body we're in, whatever sex or caste or race, whatever social status, we're all pure eternal loving servants of the Lord. That is the nature of the Atma. Jivera Swarupoy Krishna Ranityadas. And to realize that, to understand that, is what a saintly person is meant to be. Udharanda Thakur 500 years ago, was born in a family and society that religious people wanted nothing to do with. Especially the Orthodox society. Now today, it is a society everyone wants everything to do with. He was in a society of gold merchants. Now, in those days, gold merchants were notorious for being materialistic and greedy as anything. And they were considered by many to be the least likely to ever take to real spiritual life. Because they were so distracted by their greed for money, by their greed through their gold. So he was born in such a family. And Nityananda Prabhu showed his mercy to Udharanda Thakur, as did Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He didn't leave the family. He was, he was extremely wealthy. <laughs> He had everything. And Nityananda Prabhu, after visiting Kardaha, which is a place that later on he would make his own home, he went to Saptagram, the place of Udharanda Thakur. And by the time Nityananda Prabhu came there, Udharanda Thakur had already been giving Harinam, the holy names of the Lord, the knowledge of Srimad Bhagavat, Bhagavad Gita, to everyone. And all these people came to welcome Lord Nityananda with profound humility, respect, and devotion. They were inviting him to, a, to, to their homes. And Nityananda Prabhu was accepting their prasad because they were, they were great souls. And they were having kirtans in the street. Vrindavan Das Thakur said, there was no such ecstatic kirtans anywhere as in Saptagram. And they were all from the caste of gold merchants who were considered the most hopeless.
one person. His devotion transformed the entirety of the society around him. In fact, Srila Prabhupada writes that when he was a, a child, his parents would bring him to Saptagram, to that temple of Udharanda Thakur. So, so special. Recently, I was in Gaya. Gaya, the two avatars of the Lord who have appeared so far in Kali Yuga, both had special transformations in Gaya. There's Bodh Gaya, Lord Buddha. According to Jayadev Goswami, Kesha Badrita Buddha Sarira Jai Jagadi Shahari. And Srila Prabhupada quotes many times from the Srimad Bhagavatam the prediction about 2,400 years before the Bhagavatam describes how the Supreme Lord Vishnu will appear in the province of Gaya as Buddha. And according to the histories, he was a king, or a prince, the son of a king. But when he witnessed old age, disease, and death, even though he was surrounded by all luxuries and pleasures, when he saw those things and he understood they were inevitable for everyone, whoever we are. Krishna through material nature gives us a good lesson. On a spiritual level, we are all eternal souls. We're all united, we're all related. On a material platform, whether we're billionaires or whether we have nothing material, whether we're scholars or whether we're illiterate, whether we're from the East or from the West, whatever our situation may be, we have to grow old, we have to get diseased, and we have to die. It's true for every type of human, and in that sense, we have so much in common with the birds and the fish and the animals and the insects. Old age, disease, and death. It's like a common denominator that somehow or other brings us to understand, ultimately, we have so much in common. So with all his luxuries and all of his future of power and influence, what's the use? I have to grow old, get diseased, and die, and so many people are doing it. How can I save myself from that? And unless I save myself, how can I help others? What's the use of helping others unless we could actually help them in that way? So for years he traveled and studied and did different tapasyas, and then in Bodh Gaya, According to the history, under that people tree, he sat, and that's where he was enlightened. And just a few miles from there is the temple of the Vishnupad. That temple has been there for a long, long time. And interesting, one of the main messages according to Srimad Bhagavatam, of Lord Buddha, was to crash through this sectarian, materialistic consciousness in the name of religion. Because at that time, animal slaughter was the primary type of ritual in India. The Brahmins, 
they were actually inspiring this. And Buddha taught ahimsa. That true dharma is compassion and respect for all living beings. And just near the people tree, there's another tree. And there it explains when he first came out of his enlightened state, he taught that a real Brahman is not by birth, but by quality. He's Vishnu. <laughs> Krishna teaches that in Bhagavad Gita also. So specifically what his followers' philosophy and his philosophy, that's another subject. But this principle to crash through egoism, to crash through, crash through the sectarianism and manipulation and exploitation in the name of spirituality and religion was very much a part of his mission as Lord Vishnu. And the next avatar of Vishnu that came in the age of Kali was Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And from Navadweep, where he was living in the role of Nimai Pandit as a great scholar, he took permission from his mother, Sachi Devi, to go to Gaya to perform the last rites for his father who had recently passed away, and for all of his forefathers and mothers. His visit to Gaia was so instructive. Just a few miles from that tree <laughs> is the temple of Vishnu, which was such an important place. On the way, he was traveling with some students. And Nimai got a intense, apparently life-threatening fever. Such a fever. His students were so worried about him. They were bringing all sorts of herbs and all sorts of medicines and all sorts of therapies, but nothing worked. The fever just persisted. Now, how is it that the absolute truth, who's the controller of all controllers, can get a fever? Hmm? That's a logical question. If he's the controller of all material creation and all spiritual existence, aham sarvasya prabhavo matta sarvam pravartate, I'm the source of all material and spiritual worlds. Everything emanates from me. How is it possible that he can get a fever? But we can ask the same question in a different way. If the Lord is Swarat, completely independent, then how is it possible to say that he can't get a fever? Does that make sense? If the, well, if the Lord wants to have a fever, he, all he has to do is desire it. <laughs> In the Bible, it talks about a version of creation where the Lord said, let there be light and there's light. Yes. <laughs> Let there be life, and there's life. In the Vedic literatures, Lord Narayan, Maha, Karana Dakshayi Vishnu, simply by his exhalation, he desires creation. An unlimited universe it is are manifested by his own sweet will. So the Lord desires a fever, and he gets a fever. And the Lord desires not to be cured by anything. And he's not being cured by anything. Because he has a message. 
when his students were desperate and almost hopeless that our beloved teacher is, is on the verge of death and nothing could save him. He said, bring me water that has washed the feet of a saintly person. So they ran. And this particular saintly person was somebody who had certain habits that the great Brahmins of, of Navadweep thought were not very desirable in the sense that it was kind of crude. So they actually made fun of him. They didn't have a good impression of him. But Lord Chaitanya wanted the water from his feet because he wanted to show it's not about the external appearances. This person actually is a great saintly person who loves me. So they ran and got the water from his feet and the Lord drank it and immediately, within a second, his fever was gone forever. Before even entering into Gaia, this holy place, he wanted to teach this lesson. We have to go beyond all these external material designations and actually understand the essence that a person's love of God and character is their spiritual qualification. Rupa Goswami explains that sometimes the Ganga, the river Ganges, has foaming bubbles on it. Have you seen? These days, there's so many foaming bubbles. <laughs> but still, the Ganges is the Ganges. Sometimes even the same things we see on the beach that I was talking about, sometimes it's floating on top of the Ganges. But still, the Ganges is the Ganges. We don't see just the external parts. We see what is, what is the grace of the essence of what Ganga is giving us. Of course, we should try to keep her clean. That's part of our seva for her. But if other people do whatever they do, still, we honor the essence. And in this regard, Srila Prabhupada and our Acharyas quote, that one who sees the deity is made of stone, because to our senses it looks like stone. But by Krishna's sweet free will, he appears in that, in that form to accept our devotion. For those who accept the Ganga or the Charanamri to be ordinary water, the Guru to just be an ordinary person, or the Vaishnav, to perceive a Vaishnav according to their caste or their creed or their material designations is considered naraka bhuti, a very low state, a hellish kind of condition. So Mahaprabhu came to Gaya. And there, the Brahmins were great Brahmins at the time. There, specifically, they were chanting beautiful praises of Lord Vishnu. And they were offering wonderful, wonderful garlands and sandalwood and incense and cloth and, and fragrances. And Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, hearing them sing such pure prayers, at that moment, the ecstasy of his love, Sri Radha's love, manifested from him. There were torrents and torrents of tears pouring from his eyes. His hairs were standing on end. His limbs were trembling. 
Nobody had ever seen anything like this. The ecstasies of his love. And it was at that moment that Ishwar Puri, a great, great devotee, appeared. And when Lord Chaitanya saw Ishwara Puri, who he had met in Navadweep recently before, he said, the actual goal of my pilgrimage has been fulfilled because I am seeing you, a true lover of Krishna. And Lord Chaitanya asked Ishwara Puri to be his guru and to initiate him. And the background of Ishwar Puri is very interesting, we know. His guru, Madhavendra Puri, had so many exalted avatars and saints as disciples. But when he was on his deathbed, Madhavendra Puri was materially an invalid couldn't walk, couldn't sit up. His body was, it was practically destroyed by time. Ishwara Puri as his disciple was per personally serving him with such faith and devotion he wasn't seeing the defect of the body. He understood the nature of this body is to inspire people to love God. Ishwara Puri would clean him with his own hands and was constantly speaking to him Krishna's pastimes, Krishna's teachings and chanting Krishna's names. In other words, he wasn't seeing the external appearance of his guru's body. He was seeing the true substance that his guru's love for God is the great thing. And his body, whatever condition it is, if I can serve nicely, that's the ultimate purpose of life. He not only served, cleaning his urine and cleaning his stool and cleaning everything and, and sitting him up. And whatever he did, he did with gratitude, with deep affection. Materially, we would possibly think, oh, this, is, this is quite disgusting, but I'll do it anyway. but he was seeing through the eyes of devotion. Every situation, he was so grateful. He was so humbled. And he did with such love and such care to please his guru. And because of that humble spirit, Madhavendra Puri gave him a blessing. He said, my child, may you gain pure love for Krishna. And with that blessing, Ishwara Puri attained the ultimate perfection. So much so that the Supreme Lord himself, Radha Krishna Pranaya Vikritir Ladini Shakti Rakshman, that one absolute truth appeared in two as Radha Krishna for the purpose of loving relationship. And the two, Radha and Krishna, came again as one in the form of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Radha Bhava Suvalitam Nomi Krishna Swarupa. Krishna who attained who appeared with the complexion and the love of Sri Radha. And Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who was Krishna with Radha's love appeared in this world as a devotee to teach us how to become devotees by his example and by his words. 
and of all the saints in creation. He accepted in Gaya Ishwara Puri as his guru, especially to teach how much it pleases him when one sees beyond the external and actually becomes the servant of the servant of the servant of the Supreme. And Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in his mission, as was spoken, Rupa and Sanatan, they were cast out as outcasts also by the Orthodox society. Sanatan Goswami was even a prisoner. But Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu made them the supreme gurus. And Haridas Thakur, supreme guru. And also pure Brahmins, like Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. He made him a pure guru because he raised him above and beyond all these misconceptions to the essence. And our beloved Srila Prabhupada, in the mood of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wanted us to really understand that essence. I recently wrote, read a um, quotation from a very famous um, statesman who a couple centuries ago was a president of the United States. And he said that I don't remember what he said actually. So. <laughs> if there was some Sanskrit with it, I would have easily remembered. <laughs> but more or less, he said styles like the current of a river. You know, we, we kind of can, can f float and change. But principles are like the rocks of a mountain. They cannot be changed. And that was Srila Prabhupada's principle. He took the principle of pure devotion, of true Sanatan Dharma, Pure, but pure love of Krishna. That was the principle. That Siddhanta was uncompromised. But how to apply it and how to bring it out in others in a way that actually is effective and how to bring people to that true conclusion like the river, it can be adjusted. And we read Ramanuja and so many of the other great acharyas. You know, they, they very much um, focused on this principle. Gaya is very much historically a place that has been um, manipulated in many ways by very materialistic oriented Brahmins, yes, <laughs> but simultaneously a place where the Supreme Lord, in a place where there's the greatest need perhaps, has revealed this higher principle. Udaranda Thakur, he represents that higher principle. Whether people are 
from Wall Street, which is kind of like what Saptogram was, where there's so much greed and so much wealth and so much ex corruption, or whether it's in the biggest political circles. Or Jagaya Madhai, who were simply um, murderers, thieves, and rapists, the most criminal people. And also, the day I went to Gaya, I also went to Jarikanda Forest. And I went to the place where, according to many people, the footprints of the animals and Lord Chaitanya are still there in the rocks. It's a very special place. There's a temple there with Radha and Krishna, and behind there's a beautiful painting of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Leela in Jarikanda. And we all know that story. It's not far from Gaya. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was going through the forest and he induced the tigers to chant the holy names. He was going down a forest path and Jarikanda in those days was such a thick forest. The most dangerous forest in all of India. And there was a tiger sleeping right on the path. Now, you and me, we would probably go the other way. <laughs> or we would very quietly tiptoe around the tiger. But Lord Chaitanya went right up to the tiger and put his foot on the tiger's head and kicked him. The tiger woke up. Nobody does that to tigers. And Lord Chaitanya, he saw the spirit soul, he saw the atma in the tiger, he saw the potential of that tiger to love Krishna. And he told the tiger, chant Hadi Hadi. <laughs> now, if you or me did that, We would, it would be good if we chanted Hadi Hadi. Because, Antakali Chama Meva. We remember Lord Hari at the time of death, we will attain him. But Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he had such love and care for that tiger tiger could actually recognize that this person loves my, he loves me. Lord Chaitanya's love for him actually made it possible for him to understand who he was. It's similar when a saintly person, Srila Prabhupada, when he came to the West, he loved people. And he saw the potential in people. And that, could, that actually awakened faith and trust. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was seeing that, that tiger as his own beloved child, his own loving devotee. And the tiger responded. And he got up on his hind legs, raised his paws, and chanted the holy name. <laughs> and as Lord Chaitanya was walking, the tiger followed him. Lord Chaitanya started doing kirtan. 
And soon, so many tigers started following him. A whole group of tigers, a sangam of tigers. Many, perhaps dozens of tigers, were coming from all different parts of the forest and just following along his side. And on the other side of the path, many deers were following. They were so attracted because he loved them. So they were attracted to them. He was so beautiful. He was attracting their very souls. He turned to all of them and raised his arms and said, Chan, Hari, Hari. And all the tigers and all the deers began to chant. And their love, their love for God awakened and they were all chanting and all dancing and they became so intoxicated with love for Krishna. And this is real kirtan. That they spontaneously loved each other. Now when we do kirtan together, sometimes we think this person did this to me and that person did that to me and this person and, but all, oh, but Hare Krishna. <laughs> I'll deal with that after the kirtan, Hare Krishna. <laughs> Have any of you had that experience? Well, you know, the deers could be thinking that, that these tigers, they ate my wife, they ate my, they ate my husband, they ate my children, they ate my mother, and they killed, drank the blood and ate the flesh of my, all my relatives. Yes. Materially, that was the truth. But when they were united on the spiritual platform of Krishna, which is what Kirtan can do, they were brothers, they were sisters. They were friends. And the tigers and deers paired off and were embracing each other and dancing with each other. This type of dance is very nice. This is Kirtan. So Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he was bringing out that essence in chandalas, in outcasts in the most greedy gold merchants, in great, great learned Brahmins, in politicians like King Prataparudra. In those early days, these were very orthodox days that Lord Chaitanya was living. A sannyasi or one in the renounced order of life would never meet with a politician. Or to speak of a king. But King Prataparudra, even though he was a king, Lord Chaitanya first rejected him, but then he revealed his essence. He was actually, he had a very humble, sincere heart, a loving heart. And he was willing to become a beggar if that's what was required. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gave his full mercy and full blessings to the king. Golavecha Sridhar was in total poverty. The washerman tailor for Srivas Thakur was a person of another religion who was eating meat and doing all kinds of stuff like that. And Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu revealed himself to that person. Why? Because he was serving a devotee, Srivas, and he gave him ecstatic love of God. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was giving this treasure to every kind of person. Kings. People kings and poverty-stricken leaf sellers. The illiterate and the greatest scholars, the Brahmins and the untouchables. 
the tigers and the deers and the snakes and the elephants and the trees. This is the message of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. How to awaken the love of the soul. Jeev Jago, Jeev Jago, Goru Chandra Bole. Kota Nidra Jayo Maya Pisa Chira Kole. Wake up, wake up, wake up, sleeping souls. And how to wake up? This kirtan, chanting of Hare Krishna mantra, the names of God, is the most powerful way of waking up the soul. And when we chant together, the spirit of kirtan is our many hearts become one as an offering for Krishna's pleasure. That is the kirtan of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Is there any questions? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you for wonderful class. Maharaj, yesterday you told that uh, in Srimad Bhagavatam there are wonderful narrations of great uh, sages' activities also. So my question was, in uh, present scenario where the sp spiritual gurus and uh, all the spiritual sages, they are full of uh, duplicity and not genuine. and. Uh, Personal experience of mine is, is that friends and relatives, whomever, whoever I have met, they have the tendency or uh, to follow someone instead of reading the scriptures. So my question is, uh, what is the hope for the spiritual enlightenment of general populace uh, when the present uh, scenario of uh, spirituality is is such? Because there is strong tendency to follow the sages or spiritual gurus, but they are not setting up the standards. The great Vaishnava Acharyas give great emphasis to the conception of parampara which means those who are in the line of great self-realized souls. Particularly there are four paramparas in the Vaishnava school, in the Bhakti school. Ramanuja from the Sri Sampradaya, Madhva, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu from the Madhva Sampradaya, Vallabhacharya from the Rudra Sampradaya, Ramanuja from Sri Sampradaya, and Nimbarka from the Kumar Sampradai. So through these different lines, and every religion has its lines in that sense, true religions, we receive God's word, which is revealed through the Shastra, as it has been preserved and carried on from the great saintly people throughout history. And the gurus are those, the shiksha gurus and diksha gurus, they are those who are representing through their lives and through their words that immortal message which preserves the essence, which never compromises the principles, but which may float in various ways with the application or the style of how to present the principles. And when we are connected in that way and we understand what are the real qualities of a saintly person, then we're under the protection of Krishna.
if a person who is helping us in our spiritual life on whatever level, if they may have some difficulty, we understand what the current of grace is. Bhagavad Gita explains what are the qualities of a, of a true devotee. So that is important. The tendency is people become attracted to supernatural powers or charisma and these things. But the true thing we should be attracted to is the moral character, the humility, and the actual love for God that's represented in true compassion to others, and the message being that unbroken message which is coming down through the parampara. And Srila Prabhupada and our Acharyas teach us, not in a sectarian way, but in a very, very thoughtful and, and traditional way that, that God himself has established, the safe path. Does that answer your question? Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you for the wonderful class. Maharaj, you told that uh, Jharikhand uh, example that where tigers and deers come together in holy name. Uh, today's scenario in uh, society, the political leaders, they are making individual groups and uh, due to that they are making a popular but uh, normal, ma normal men, they are like fighting each other, where, even if they are staying together. My question is, the leaders are popular, but common marriage, they are suffering in society. And due to that, they are uh, neglecting spirituality and they are uh, mis godless civilization. They are not keeping faith on God, uh, Miss Krishna, or any other Hindu sp uh, scripture or all these things. So, I would like to miss uh, what is the solution to this uh, uh, practical scenario? Because there is there are so many leaders, they are, uh, miss in India, if you can see the spirituality, on the name of spirituality, there are so many sages are there, but uh, people are not following them. And political leaders, they are uh, majorly on secular, secular base. They don't want to uh, give more importance to our uh, Vedic scripture, they want to follow, uh, give more importance to minority. Hare Krishna. <laughs> I'm not going to ask which political party you will vote for. <laughs> but ego, when there is this egoism and materialism built upon the foundation of egoism, there's always so many distractions from the truth. And that's the nature of the world. So our purpose is not so much to be involved in this political party or that political party. Our purpose is to actually change ourselves. Ultimately, we're the well-wisher of the soul of everyone. Yes? And by cultivating our own purification through our spiritual practice, our sadhana, and by um, associating with people who have a like mind to do the same, we can actually develop spiritual strength to overcome that tendencies within ourselves. Because actually whatever discrepancies we're seeing outside, we have the same things in ourselves, on different levels, do we not? Yes, whatever corruption there is outside of us, you know, we have those tendencies within ourselves. And the reason why they are the way they are is because they haven't addressed it within themselves. And the reason why we're not in ecstasy 
as instruments of pure compassion to the world is because we haven't done that to ourselves. We haven't addressed it seriously within ourselves either. Yes. So it begins with ourself. And we need that like-minded association of inspired, enlightened people to, to actually empower us to take it seriously. And when we have that sangam or community of devotees who actually are connecting with Krishna's grace, then we become the instruments of that grace together to try to actually make substantial, real changes in the world. There's a saying, physician should heal himself or herself. Yes? So we can see all these problems in the world, and they're true. But we have to look to our own soul. If we actually, if we have to solve the problem within ourselves. We have to solve these problems with our own little devotee community. <laughs> and then we'll actually have the power to make real changes within the world. Beyond all these designations, we have to overcome our own egos. Harinama, Harinam, Harinam eva kevalam, kalo nasteva, 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 gatiranyat. The scripture tells us in this age of Kali, the medicine that we can take individually and collectively for the purpose of actually curing that and actually bringing about real positive spiritual change within the world is the chanting of the names of Hadi. question. Yes. Be prepared for this question. Hare <laughs> Krishna Maharaj, this one uh, is related to the morning class. Uh, we discussed that how Krishna is all pure and all his activities are ba completely based on, like, you know, they are transcendental. But uh, uh, about other personalities, other great personalities, like uh, we hear in Puranas, like how Indra or Vayu, they get affected by lust. So how do we understand that at the same time, keeping our respect for those respectable personalities? We have to see individual circumstances in perspective of the larger picture. Yes? You're speaking about... Like, for example, Indra being attracted by Ahalya. Yeah, or Indra. Yes. Huh. is a special person in the sense that <laughs> let's see it this way so many places in the Bhagavad Purana and Puranas he's doing yajyas and Vishnu is personally coming to receive yes does he do that with you so interest kind of special and so many people get attracted and um, fall down from their standards in this world, yes? 
And some of them, you know, they're in the newspapers for a few days. <laughs> yes? But how many of them are continuously in the Puranas? None of them, yes? Because it's insignificant. You know, they, they, they have some difficulty, they may somehow stay in power, they may lose their power, and then people forget about it. Well, we're reading about Indra when things that happen in Satya Yuga. Yes? But evolve. So if we see it in the whole picture, he's a very, very powerful, great person. But, but he does have his difficulties. But Krishna wants to show the world lessons through such people. Otherwise, why are they there in the scriptures? If Maya is so powerful that it could infect, infect Indra when he becomes too much enamored by his power, by his fame and popularity, by his wealth, if he could get enamored by those things and what is our position? Yes? The idea is we should become, we should be humble. Puman, <laughs> Kunti said, if we become too infatuated due to beauty, due to great wealth, due to fame and high, high, high education or high birth, if we become infatuated and proud, thinking I'm better than others, then we can't chant God's names with feeling. We can't take shelter of the Lord in a qualitative, sincere way. So we all have these tendencies. And to make a very, very strong example Krishna uses Indra, yes? Even though he's such a great devotee, still, if he becomes proud of his wealth or his, or his, or his beauty or his knowledge or of these other things, if he disrespects others because of that pride, then it's just a matter of time till Maya overcomes him. So Krishna's teaching us these lessons and Indra is uh, such a special choice of Krishna to be giving us one example after another. <laughs> yes, because Indra means a controller. Yes, and we all have that Indra bhav. That <laughs> we all have that mood of trying to be a controller and trying to be an enjoyer. Trinata pisunichena turor ibasihishna. Amani namana dena kirtaniya sadhari. We need to humble ourselves. We need to take shelter of the association of saintly people. We need to take shelter of the holy dames, knowing if it could happen to Indra, Krishna, please save little me. <laughs> yes? So we give our greatest appreciation to Indra for teaching us these lessons. Yes? And in this spirit, we chant the whole day. in that spirit of our honor and respect for the wonderful lessons that Lord Chaitanya taught us through Indra. Indra's son is Arjuna, yes? <laughs> so all honor and respect, but Krishna sometimes uses his devotee for these purposes. He put Bhishma, a Mahajan on the wrong side to teach us a lesson. However powerful, great we are, 
if we're not on the side of Dharma, we're going to ultimately be vanquished. Hmm? Even Shiva, the great Mahadev, when he chased after Mohini Murti, and all the sages were watching, I'm thinking, Our, my Lord, what are you doing? <laughs> You taught us not to do this, and now you're doing it. Huh? Lord Shiva, in the end, he was so proud of Krishna. <laughs> that you used me as an example to teach the whole world. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes? And even Arjuna who was Krishna's most intimate friend. He also went into an illusion on the bank, on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. After he saw who was assembled before him. Why? It was Krishna's arrangement to teach the world through his devotees. Let us have kirtan. Thank you very, very much.